Video game adaptations are a strange beast. Putting a video game into a different medium like a movie or a show can be a tough feat, which is why you usually need good actors, decent directors, and above all, good writers to pull it all off. Unfortunately for us, those people sometimes seem to be in short supply, which is why video game adaptations are often a crapshoot, emphasis on the crap. You can get something that fans generally receive quite well, like The Last of Us TV series, or a movie you didn't expect to be good like Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2, or you can get something bizarre and strange like the 1993 Super Mario Bros. movie, which probably made unsuspecting kids cry when they first saw it. And there are times still where we could be blessed with greatness, but there has been no video game adaptation anticipated as much as Halo. If you're a Halo fan, you know the pain, and if you're not a Halo fan, well, the history behind it is still really interesting, which is why when we finally got the Paramount Plus Halo series, it made it that much worse. So what led us to this? Two years after the release of Halo 2 in 2005, Microsoft went to work with 20th Century Fox and Universal Pictures to produce a Halo movie which would stick close to the games. And Microsoft straight up refused to hand over creative control to the studios. As Microsoft dealt with the contracts, they began hiring staff. Bungie announced on their website that Peter Jackson would be the executive producer, and this was right around the time when Lord of the Rings movies were being released, so everyone was rightfully freaking out, in a good way. Mr. Del Toro was originally hired to be the director, but that felt through and eventually Neil Blomkamp, future director of District 9, was brought on instead. Also, the great Oscar-nominated Alex Garland would be the lead writer for the script. Everything was in place for this to be one of the greatest gaming films of all time. Then fate took a huge dump on everyone. Fox and Universal got upset about the cut of money that Microsoft and Jackson would be taking, and eventually they parted ways. Blomkamp then openly stated in 2007 that the Halo movie was dead. But the Halo adaptation legacy doesn't stop there. After Halo fans were depressed that the Jason and Blomkamp Halo movie was never happening, we were again teased by another Hollywood giant, Steven Spielberg. In 2013, it was stated that he would be the executive producer of a Halo TV series, and to make a long story short, that didn't happen either. Years passed, Bungie was gone, 343 was busy making Halo games, and all the talk and rumors of a full-on Halo movie or TV show went silent. Besides a few one-offs or short series that were hit or miss, it looked like we were never getting the true Halo movies or shows we so desperately wanted. The fan base was furiously edged for years and ultimately abandoned, in hopes of a Halo movie or series faded. Then it happened. On June 28th, 2018, everyone's favorite 343 transmedia personality, Kiki Wolfkill, announced to the world that we would get a real, honest-to-God Halo TV series on Showtime. Okay, that part, it actually turned out to be Paramount+, Plus, but just ignore that. But this was it, folks. It actually felt real this time. And despite what people had thought about 343 up to this point, people were absolutely fired up for this moment. Then after waiting over two decades, we finally got it. We were about to watch our favorite game series of all time be adapted into a TV show. This was the moment everyone had been waiting for. And then... The Paramount Plus Halo TV series was received as one of the worst pieces of gaming media that people had ever laid eyes on. Ass shots, finger blades, Chief having sex with a war criminal, more ass shots, MacGuffins, a lack of action, and... Quan. It was a mess unlike anything that Halo fans had anticipated. But why exactly do people hate the Halo TV series? What actually made it so bad? Well today folks, we're going to answer that question and find out the honest and true reasons why so many people hate the Halo TV series. We can't critique each and every episode, but it would bypass some of the major overall issues with the show. And in explaining these major issues, we'll be able to paint a better picture of the true reason that this show was so hated. And with season two well on the way, what better time than now to talk about it? To start, we have to discuss one issue that we simply won't be able to avoid or look past as it's so pervasive and critical to the entirety of the show that it doomed it from the start. Remember when I said in the beginning that a video game adaptation is really only as good as its script? You can have all the action, beautiful CGI, and cool set pieces that you want, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is the script. So now I'm sure you're wondering who was tasked to do this? Who would take one of the greatest and most beloved games of all time and write a script fitting of its legacy? The ones responsible for the writing behind the Halo TV series are as follows. Writers Stephen Kane and Kyle Killen and executive producer Kiki Wolfkill. Now the drama surrounding the Halo TV series really all started when this infamous news article dropped and I'm sure you know the one that I'm talking about. It's the one where the showrunner Stephen Kane stated that the entire creative team did not look at the game's 
for any of their writing. The exact quote was, We didn't look at the game. We didn't talk about the game. We talked about the characters and the world, so I never felt limited by it being a game. Now, a lot of people who defend the show and the showrunners will argue that this was taken out of context and that it didn't mean that they threw away the games altogether. It was simply that they weren't going to follow the stories of the games, but I think it shows us something much worse. The fact that Steven said, quote, So I never felt limited by it being a game, end quote, already shows that he doesn't respect the medium that he's adapting. Thinking that a video game story is limiting is a frankly false assertion and really shows a disconnect in the writing philosophy right from the start. Even looking past Halo, other games tell amazing and emotional stories, ones that might stick with us more than a movie or a show would. And with something that has such a vast and deep lore as Halo does, I find it very hard to describe Halo as limiting. So when your showrunner who's adapting your favorite game says it would just kind of get in his way, that's a problem. However, even if we'd write this off, let's just say Steven didn't mean exactly what he said, it gets worse. Enter 343's very own Kiki Wolfkill to wrap up this cluster with a quote of her own. The exact quote from our girl Kiki was, Early on, we were thinking about doing something that could tie very closely with the game. What we were finding was trying to verbatim stay with everything that comes before wasn't serving the medium. It also wasn't serving the creative teams and their need to express a story and build the world through their eyes. Now I want you to sit on that for just a second and really think about why Halo fans might not like her sentiment. The idea that your team needed some kind of creative outlet and they effectively chose Halo as the canvas to just barf out their own story onto is disgusting. Now I don't know if Kiki didn't mean exactly what she said, but it really seems like we had a bunch of stuck up I know better than you writers working on this show. Writers who took one look at the Halo lore and said, nah, and then felt the quote, need to express a story and build the world through their eyes. I mean, it's already been built. It's Halo, and it used to be one of the biggest and most beloved games in the world. Just do that, maybe? All of this immediately made fans upset. No one really wanted this something different that 343 and the showrunners wanted to give us. People simply wanted Halo, and that's all they wanted from back in 2001 when Halo Combat Evolved came out. And they, of course, made their voices heard. Now, there are some nice little Easter eggs within the show and some first-person moments with Chief to give a nice little nod to the Halo fans out there. However, it seems like the majority of the show was simply made to pander to what people in the business like to call the broader audience. Meaning that you can watch this without even knowing a thing about Halo, and the characters that you know and love from the game, they just aren't here anymore. They were replaced with pandering, corporate signed off, focus group appeasing husks that only kind of resemble your favorite characters, sometimes in name only. You'd be hard pressed to match up almost any personality traits between the game characters and their show counterparts. There's also points in the show where you just know the writers were going for that Game of Thrones sex and interpersonal drama appeal. And with Halo, it just doesn't work. It feels awkward and embarrassing. So after all of this, and just looking at the writing team alone, it makes sense why some people hate the Halo TV series. When you have writers that from the get-go were already saying that games are limiting, that Halo restricted them and didn't allow them to express their creativity, they wrote characters that we only recognize by their names, and the fact that this series was getting sex scenes and awkward moments shoved down its throat, you're simply bound to piss a lot of people off. And again, this is the writing. It's something you literally can't look past. So now that we know the writer's outlook on the games, the next question is obviously, what did they end up giving us? Well, it's a lot of ass. Now, what would a Halo TV series look like without the Master Chief? Well, I'll tell you, this is what it looks like. It's right here. Unfortunately for everyone involved in making the Halo TV series, the main character, the one that we're supposed to love, became the target of criticism almost immediately, and a general sentiment of this isn't the Chief pervaded through most comments about the show. So as we all know, the Master Chief in the Halo games is a quiet guy, strong, calculated, and quiet. But when he does talk, it's impactful. Sometimes it's humorous, and sometimes it conveys his emotions. And above all, he never takes his helmet off. The funny thing is, you can still get so much feeling and emotion just by looking at Chief's body language and the context clues of what's happening within the story and on screen. So much so that even without seeing Chief's face, we know exactly how he feels in almost every scene. Hey, that's some really good writing. But when it came to the story writers for the Halo TV series, they just said, Fuck it. We need to show his face immediately. How the hell else are we going to show how he feels? It's not like that's one of Chief's core main features of his character that he doesn't take his helmet off. There's literally no other show or game that has a character always wearing their helmet, and it's literally impossible to show emotion that way, and we can't possibly do it. Take the guy. This ended up being one of the biggest memes of the first season of the Halo TV series. A lot of people straight up hated it. Some thought that Chief would never remove his helmet, and we get something more akin to the Mandalorian. But to be fair, Baby Yoda helped a lot to give us context clues on how Mando was feeling. As in, Mando had someone 
or something to react with. So I guess there really was no way that the Hail Riders could do it. There wasn't some ever-present being that would constantly be at Chief's side to help convey Chief's emotion. Anyway, Mr. Pablo Schreiber, the guy who plays Chief in the show, also has this opinion. When asked during an IGN interview what he thought about people who wanted him to keep his helmet on, Pablo said, I'm sorry, but it's the only choice for long-form storytelling in television. What I would say to anybody who disagrees with that, I totally respect that opinion. But it's a pretty basic place to start when you're talking about making a television show of quality. While this quote came out recently, it only solidified the opinions of those that already hated the show. It kind of reinforced to the fans how the guy playing the main character not only didn't understand the Master Chief in the games, he apparently never saw the Mandalorian either. There are almost too many scenes to go through where it would be better if Chief had his helmet on, and some that are comically hilarious when he takes his helmet off. But enough about Master Chief, it's time to talk about Master Cheeks. When you have about eight butt scenes, it was clear to the viewers that the writers thought they were making Game of Thrones and kept inserting sex scenes and nudity where it just didn't belong. This can of course be done tastefully, though sometimes not entirely necessary. Nudity and sex just sometimes fits within a show. Unfortunately, in Halo, a show about aliens killing people and emotionless killing machines called Spartans, it couldn't be more out of place. But there was one scene in particular that even upset some of those fans who were still holding on to hope, and that was, of course, when Master Chief meets a girl who's an imprisoned war criminal and has sex with her. This scene alone showed viewers that we were dealing with a script and character that was alien to the entire core of what Halo was. It was at this point that Halo fans knew the showrunners were off the rails, and this wasn't actually Halo or Master Chief, and had become far too ridiculous to even be an alternate timeline. Finally, one more huge point that was amiss with a lot of fans was a very silly plot point of the show, and this was the inhibitor pellets. This one hits both checkboxes for angry fans. It ruins established lore, and it's bad writing. In the book, Spartans are kidnapped children, blasted with body-enhancing chemicals, forced into training and battle for decades, and made into ultimate killing machines. They still have emotions, but they're not robots. In the show, they are kind of robots because they are implanted with this pellet that erases all emotions. The original lore explaining why Spartans are the way they are is much more rich and detailed than in the show. It allows for Spartans to still have emotions and personality that aren't regulated while also being trained killing machines. In the show, their personality has nothing to do with how they were raised or how they feel about the situation or how they feel about the Spartan program. It's just because they have something implanted in them. Take it out, everything's back to normal. You have feelings again, you're a normal human. And speaking of normal humans, I think it's time we talk about one of the most hated of them all. As far as reasons why people hate the Halo TV series go, Quan is usually at the top of that list. She not only embodies everything wrong with the Halo TV series, but everything wrong with modern writing. So let me explain why this girl with the rat haircut gets so much hate. Quan is completely useless and one of the most stupid and genuinely annoying characters I've ever come across in media and many others feel this way. And you know it's bad when people beg for your star character to die a horrible death. Yet in a move that baffled the entire audience, the showrunners tried to force us to like Quan and enjoy her story. So much so that they gave her an entire episode, which is one of the worst rated in the entire series, no surprise there. This character not only has the ability to constantly make stupid decisions, she also made everyone around her morons as well. Just looking at the first episode, Quan's tribe of rebels gets attacked by the Covenant, and the Spartans arrive to save everyone's ass. When Quan gets asked by the UNSC to tell everyone that the Spartans saved them, she refuses for some reason, and not only that, the UNSC believes that she has some sort of leverage over them. I honestly don't understand why they didn't just kill her right there. Then in that same episode, Quan somehow befriends John Halo and causes him to remove his helmet while she's pointing a gun at him. So Quan really gave a bad first impression from the start and then show writers didn't make it any easier on us. Quan is constantly at odds with people who are willing to help her, yet shows little to no compassion or thanks to anyone around her. In one episode, a spar in Sorin is trying to get Quan to safety, but Quan knocks him out and threatens to kill him. She's selfish, loud, and annoying, yet we are constantly shoved away from the main story to be forced to watch more of Quan. It's kind of hard to understand what Kiki Wolfkill and the gang had in mind for this character, but we can probably guess. Modern writing and shows usually require a strong female character by default, not out of necessity for the story, but for checking off the socially acceptable box. The only problem is modern writers, especially the ones writing Halo, have absolutely no idea how to write a strong female character. This ironically comes off as being more sexist when we see their final product of what they think a strong woman is. 
Quan has to be strong and independent. Okay, well, let's make her a complete unstable bitch who hates everyone and causes problems for every single person she comes into contact with. That's what women do, right? They they yell at people and overwhelm them through their anger. But by far the worst offense by Quan was that she had the audacity to get an entire episode dedicated to her. Reading into this episode, I saw a theory suggested by others that this was an episode meant to set up a side series for Quan. In fact, it's really the only explanation that would make sense and not be completely embarrassing for the writers. Quan is undoubtedly one of the major issues with the show as a whole. She unfortunately takes up so much screen time that it's impossible to ignore her and eventually turned a lot of people away from the show. So finally, with that, we come to the last major issue. We might have a bad main character, bad supporting character, and writers that have absolutely zero interest in the established Halo lore, but maybe, just maybe, they can make something that's worth watching. A story that's interesting. One that Halo fans and viewers new to the series can enjoy together. That's what everyone hoped for at least, then the show came out. Instead they decided to make a new story and go with what they call the Silver Timeline. Even without going through every single episode, we could pick out so many odd writing decisions in this show that it's really no wonder that it didn't work for a lot of people, fans of Halo or not. For instance, the entire character of Chief is written quite poorly. The Master Chief in the games knows exactly what he has to do to get the job done. In the show, he's whiny, angry, and unsure of himself half the time. His arc is even worse. He starts out as a suppressed emotionless Spartan, then removes his pellet, has some feelings, has sex, but then by the end of it, he just gives up. Like, the Master Chief isn't enough to fight off the Covenant, he has to give his body to Cortana. I don't know, this part where Cortana took over Chief's body was confusing and frankly stupid and completely ruined his character. Not to mention, everything that led to this point was pretty ridiculous as well. We're introduced to a MacGuffin in literally the first episode, an artifact that Chief touches and it just magically moves the story along. Which is literally on the nose for what a MacGuffin is. These kinds of things can be done well, but here it is not. It quite literally forcefully shoves the story along. Oh, Chief is trapped in a disabled ship? Well, he could touch the artifact and we'll fix that ship right up. Oh, Chief doesn't remember his family? Oh, touch the keystone, everything's remembered. It might be worse than that suspicious looking thing from Picard. All of this plus the forced interpersonal drama, the love scenes, the annoying coming of age Quan story, the Maki covenant relationship plot, all of this, it just doesn't work. And it makes the fact that this is a Halo show even more confusing. What you really need at the forefront is the idea of the Covenant being a dominating and looming threat, forcing humanity to band together as the UNSC, humanity's last hope. The Spartans could have their own relationships with each other, we could see how humanity struggles through this truly dire time, how regular humans are forced into battle against these monsters, and how devastating it is to live through. You simply don't get any of that from the show. The only interesting thing we get is the morality of the Spartan program, I guess, but the writing around it is just so awful and it's just done so much better in the books that it's hard to ignore. Can a Halo show be done that completely ignores the story of the games? Possibly, but this is not the way to do it. Now we all know the meme, ODST, Gritty, Band of Brothers show, yep, we've heard that now about a million times, we get it. But fans have begged for years for a show just to be Band of Brothers, but with ODSTs and Dark and Gritty, don't forget that. But the funny thing is, that would have really worked a hundred times better than the Halo TV series did. And at the very least, it would have felt more like Halo. You can clearly see this by how much fans absolutely love the ODST ad that came out back 14 years ago. In those two short minutes, this ad elicited more emotion than the Halo series did over nine episodes. The cinematography, the CGI, hell, even the story, it's so impressive how they pulled all of this off. I know that fans constantly ask for a gritty ODST show, but this single two minute commercial is why, and you can't blame them. It's kind of sad to think about this because we were constantly given glimpses of how good we could have had it. Imagine what the original Halo movie pitched back in 2005 could have been like, or a show that looked like the ODST or the other live action ads that we were given at the time. But even though fans hated this series and it was at best lukewarm for others, everyone still had to face this sad fact. And that is that Halo made a shit ton of money for Paramount+. Plus. If we believe what the suits say about it, then it actually got a ton of views and became the most watched show on the platform for the first day. We don't know exactly how many people actually stuck around for the rest, and these companies never released their numbers, so I guess we'll never actually know. Do we really think that a show that followed the games verbatim or a show that was just focused on ODSTs would be good enough to gain these kinds of views? I would argue, yes. I mean, we will never know for sure, but I could say that we already got millions upon millions of fans that actually play the games and love those stories, so... The problem is that doesn't matter anymore. The Halo series is here to stay, and it's all about what will make the most money while the writers get to have their ego stroked working on an IP that they don't deserve. 
What we do know for sure though is that the Halo TV series actually did well enough metric wise that it made sense for Paramount to make another season, which is releasing within a few weeks of me recording this video. Currently the only hope that we have is that there is a new showrunner, David Weiner. Will he be able to write the ship? Only time will tell. And that is why a lot of people hate the Halo TV series. From the writers and how they view the games, their need to do something different and failing, to the unrecognizable characters and the awful new ones that just make us hate watching altogether, down to the poor writing itself. It all just comes together as a mess for longtime fans and those new to the show. I for one couldn't imagine if this was my first introduction into Halo, but that's just me. Will Paramount learn from their mistakes, or will this be the last season of Halo that we are beaten down with yet again? What I do know for sure is that I will make a video about it. Either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe and do all that stuff. I am pushing. I'm making a concerted effort to get to 10,000 happy and satisfied subscribers by the end of 2024. So let's make that happen. More videos coming soon. Bye-bye.